Thank you. Thank you. It's really a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, thank you for your friendly welcome. Patricia, thanks for your invitation. I'm really happy to be here in particular at the Center for Constitutional Studies. I've grown and developed a great deal as a result of learning from the publications and the, the speaker series you have here. In fact, I'm currently reviewing Howard Leeson's book on the Patriation Minutes for a project that I'm working on related to Canadian constitutional change. And uh, before I begin, just to my old friend, Professor Moin Yaha, thank you for, for coming. It's nice to see you. So my subject today is constitutional desuetude. I intend to show that a written constitution may be amended by this phenomenon of desuetude. I intend to develop a framework for understanding what it means to say that a constitution has been amended by constitutional desuetude. And I hope to demonstrate that the Canadian Constitution has in fact been amended by desuetude. And I will also speculate as to whether the United States Constitution could be amended in this way. And so I therefore have three objectives today. First is to illustrate this phenomenon. Second is to show that it's occurred here in Canada, my native land, by the way. And third, to explore the possibilities for constitutional desuetude in the United States. To begin, we need to define two terms. One is a common term, and the second is less common, amendment and desuetude. So first, what is an amendment? A written constitution can be amended in two ways, formally and informally. A formal amendment refers to a textual constitutional change made in conformity with the amendment rules that are entrenched in the text of that constitution. And it results in a change to the written constitution. So for example, the German constitution, known as the Basic Law, requires a supermajority approval in the Bundestag and the Bundesrat to pass a formal amendment. In 2009, supermajorities in Germany formally amended the Basic Law when they agreed to a balanced budget amendment. It was then written into the text of the Basic Law. In the United States, Article 5 of the Constitution provides four ways to formally amend the Constitution. Here in Canada, Part 5 of the Constitution Act 1982 also provides five ways, with a few wrinkles, to formally amend the Constitution. So that is one way to amend the Constitution, formal amendment. Written Constitution may, may also be amended informally. Informal amendment refers to a change in meaning without a corresponding change in text. The distinction between formal and informal amendment has been observed across jurisdictions, including by scholars here in Canada about Canada. For example, Ron Herschel, Alan Hutchinson, Joseph Magnier, and Jeremy Weber, among many others. I think perhaps the best way to conceptualize this concept of an informal amendment is the metaphor of a hydraulic system posited by Heather Gerken, professor at Yale Law School. She writes, where the natural path of formal amendment is difficult or blocked, alternative paths open to political actors to achieve its functional equivalent. So where formal amendment is onerous or difficult, informal amendment becomes common. Major methods of informal amendment include judicial interpretation, national legislation, executive action, implication, and convention. These can have the same effect as a formal constitutional amendment that is written into the text of a constitution. The difference between formal and informal amendment is not that one is law and the other is not. It is that the former is entrenched law while the latter is not. When the Constitution is amended informally, the product of the amendment is not memorialized into the constitutional text. So how then can we know whether the Constitution has in fact been amended? Stephen Griffin of Tulane University offers a five-part test to identify when the meaning of the Constitution changes informally. First, the change must work a reordering of constitutional rules. Second. That change must set the standard for future actions of political actors, and thereby, third, create a norm that is functionally equivalent to a formal rule. Fourth, the change must be driven self-consciously by political actors who intend to make the change and whose successors abide by it. And fifth, 
the change must permeate the conventional understanding that lawyers and judges hold about the Constitution. Although Griffin doesn't define this test in this way, I interpret it as establishing five criteria for identifying informal amendment. First, a constitutional reordering. Two, a standard setting. Three, norm generation. Four, self-consciousness. And fifth, permeation. So what is an example of an informal amendment here in Canada? The secession reference informally amended the Constitution when it imported unwritten meta-constitutional preconditions into the rules for formal amendment. The court identified four unwritten underlying constitutional principles that must govern the formal amendment process, namely federalism, democracy, constitutionalism, and the rule of law, and finally, fourth, respect for minority rights. These are not written into the rules of formal amendment here in Canada, but now, as a result of that ruling, these unwritten principles are now binding on political actors. It's as though they are written into Part 5 of the Constitution Act 1982 as preconditions for passing an amendment. So that's what we mean by amendment, both formal and informal. Now, desuetude. To say that a provision has fallen into desuetude is to highlight its non-use and to suggest that it is now obsolete. The concept of desuetude, or desuetude, I think the proper pronunciation is desuetude, but I prefer desuetude, um, it generally applies to the criminal law. So non-use, obsolescence. This begs the question how a provision becomes obsolete as a result of non-use. So I turn to Hans Kelsen, who defines desuetude as a negative custom whose essential function is to abolish the validity of an existing norm as a result of never being applied or obeyed. On this view, a legal norm loses its validity as authorities fail to enforce it and as the public ceases to abide by it. In addition to a failure to enforce and public rejection, desuetude also entails a temporal dimension. A given rule must remain unenforced and rejected over a significant period of time before it can be said to have fallen into desuetude. Neither time, non-use, or rejection alone is sufficient to establish it. Each is necessary. Desuetude entails official, official disregard for a written rule. Cass Sunstein states the point in terms of legitimacy. Quote, when a law is so inconsistent with people's values that it cannot, in a democracy, be much enforced, it loses its legitimacy. It has no claim to regulate conduct at all. So desuetude may be therefore understood in terms of three elements. Significant time, conscious non-use, and repudiation. It is the sustained conscious non-use of a rule that has been publicly repudiated by political actors. Now, just as a law may fall into desuetude, so may a constitutional provision. And I use the phrase constitutional desuetude as a shorthand for informal amendment by desuetude. Constitutional desuetude is a form of informal amendment, but it also bears unique properties that distinguish it from other forms of informal amendment. Under other forms of informal amendment, the constitutional text reflects continuity in the regime's legal and political realities insofar as an informal amendment does not usually alter the actual text of the Constitution, but rather supplements or clarifies it. So when the Canadian Supreme Court wrote that formal amendment in Canada must respect these four unwritten principles, the court did not contradict the text of Part 5 of the Constitution Act. It added to it, albeit without entrenching a new writing in the constitutional text. In contrast, constitutional desuetude reflects a disjuncture between the regime's legal and political realities. The desuetudinal pr provision remains entrenched in the text, not yet nor perhaps ever to be repealed, despite being rendered politically inoperative as a result of conscious non-use. So therefore, whereas other forms of informal amendment generally leave the constitutional text entrenched, unchanged, and politically valid, Constitutional desuetude leaves the text entrenched and unchanged, but renders that text politically invalid. 
So where can we find examples of constitutional desuetude, of a constitution that has been informally amended by desuetude? My answer is Canada. And I intend to illustrate six examples of constitutional desuetude. Four examples concern provisions that have actually fallen into desuetude. And two concern a provision that may be in the very early stages of desuetude and whose meaning has therefore not yet changed as a result of constitutional desuetude, but perhaps one day could. Under the Canadian Constitution, the power of reservation belongs to both the British and Canadian governments. The Constitution Act 1867 grants the Governor General the power to reserve a bill. After both houses of the Canadian Parliament have passed the bill, it's sent to the Governor General for one of three actions. First, to assent to the bill on behalf of the monarch, in which case it becomes a law. Second, to deny assent, in which case the bill does not become a law. And third, to reserve the bill for further instructions from the British government. The reserve bill does not become law unless and until the British government assents to the bill, which it must do within two years, otherwise the reserved bill expires. The Canadian government possesses the very same power of reservation over provincial legislation. We can therefore speak separately of the British and Canadian powers of reservation. Likewise, the power of disallowance belo belongs to both the British and Canadian governments under the Canadian Constitution. The Constitution Act of 1867 authorizes the British government to disallow or repeal a law passed by the Parliament of Canada. The Canadian government possesses the very same power with respect to provincial laws. And so likewise, we can speak of two separate powers of the British and the Canadian powers of reservation. Both pairs of powers, British and Canadian reservation, British and Canadian disallowance, have been informally amended out of the Canadian Constitution as a result of this phenomenon of constitutional desuetude. Now remember how we're defining desuetude. The sustained and conscious non-use of a rule that has been publicly repudiated by political actors but that remains textually entrenched in the constitutional text. Neither the British power of reservation or disallowance has been used for over a century. They've been used only once in 21 times, respectively, since their entrenchment in the 1867 Constitution Act. The last year the British government exercised its power of reservation was 1878, and the first and only exercise of disallowance occurred in 1873. Both reservation and disallowance were ultimately rejected as Canada gradually gained its independence, as exhibited in the Balfour Declaration of 1926, the 1930 Report on Dominion Legislation, and the Statute of Westminster, Westminster in 1931. The Balfour Declaration recognized Canada and other Commonwealth countries as self-governing communities and described them as, quote, autonomous communities within the British Empire, equal in status, in no way subordinate one to the other in any aspect of their, their domestic or external affairs, though united by a common allegiance to the crown and freely associated as members of the British Commonwealth of Nations. The declaration also signaled an end to the office of the Governor General as anything but largely a ceremonial representative of the British crown. As the declaration states, the Governor General, quote, is not the representative or agent of His Majesty's government government in Britain or of any department of that government. The 1930 report confirmed Canada's growing independence as it led to an agreement that the British powers of reservation and disallowance would not be used in Canada anymore. And one year later, the Statute of Westminster gave effect to the Balfour Declaration and to the 1930 report. The Statute of Westminster effectively abolished the British powers of reservation and disallowance, yet both powers today remain textually entrenched in the Constitution Act of 1867. Now, the story of Canadian reservation and disallowance is a bit more complicated. From Confederation until 1896, the Canadian government disallowed 65 provincial laws and reserved 57. From 1896 to 1920, the numbers declined to 31 and 8, respectively. Over the subsequent 26 years until 1946, there were 16 disallowances and four reservations. So we can perceive a declining pattern in the use of both powers. Indeed, today, 
Over half a century has elapsed since the most recent uses of disallowance and reservation. Disallowance was last used in 1943, about 70 years ago, and reservation most recently about 50 years ago in 1961. Both powers remain entrenched today in the text and theoretically usable by the Canadian government, yet it's unlikely that either power would ever be revived given their prolonged non-use and rejection by political actors, as well as given the evolution of Canadian federalism. This combination of desuetude, history, and illegitimacy is strong evidence that a constitutional convention now exists against the exercise of both of these powers. And so the effect of this new convention has been to informally amend the Canadian Constitution such that although both powers appear in the text, they are treated as though they had been repealed by formal amendments. And there are important reasons why both powers have become unused and are now unusable. The provincial rights movement is prominent among them. In the first 30 years following the adoption of the Constitution Act of 1867, the provincial rights movement advocated two principles. One, provincial autonomy, and two, a formalist reading of the Constitution. This movement argued that provinces were separate sovereigns, final arbiters of matters within their own jurisdiction, and that the national government's use of disallowance undermined the very idea of provincial autonomy. From the provincial perspective, it made little sense, to quote from Robert Vipond, to have exclusive jurisdiction in provincial matters if the boundaries of that jurisdiction could be contracted at the whim of the federal government. If provincial autonomy meant anything, it meant both independence from the federal government and a fair sharing of power with it. It meant both legal independence and political power. This movement therefore rejected the power of disallowance. I'm going to skip ahead to so that a, that a convention now exists against the use of reservation and disallowance in Canada doesn't appear to be a controversial point. The leading scholar of constitutional conventions here in Canada, Andrew Hurd, writes that there now exists a, quote, widely based consensus against using either power. He concludes that, quote, clear and broadly accepted conventions have arisen to nullify the powers of disallowance and reservation and that the Supreme Court would likely agree were it faced with the question, quote, with its recent willingness to deal with conventional questions touching on constitutionality and legitimacy, the Supreme Court of Canada would now in all likelihood state that the powers of reservation and disallowance have been neutered by convention. And so to borrow from Alan Cairns, the erosion of both powers is the result of, quote, concrete Canadian political facts that now form part of Canadian political culture. The content of both powers have all but vanished from the Constitution. All that remains is the text. Now, interestingly, the Canadian judiciary has filled the void left by the obsolescence of the disallowance and reservation powers. Today, instead of exercising its unilateral power to disallow or reserve provincial legislation, the national government turns to the courts to undo or review provincial legislation by either raising a constitutional challenge or requesting an advisory opinion, a reference from the court. A study of the reference procedure has shown that as much as 84% of all references concern the distribution of powers between the federal and provincial governments. It's very interesting. This would have been the very same kind of conflict that would have led, once upon a time, the federal government to disallow or reserve a provincial law. Now, one additional provision figures into our discussion of desuetude here in Canada, and that is Section 33, the Notwithstanding Clause. This legislative override power appears, as you know, in a single section of the Charter and confers the same powers upon both the federal parliament and the provincial legislature. So we can therefore interpret the Charter as creating two related, but I think analytically distinguishable powers of legislative override. You have the federal and the provincial legislative override. The legislative override has not yet fallen into desuetude. Now, perhaps the federal legislative override is close to what I want to identify as the pre-desuetudinal stage. I'm glad to see nodding in the audience. It's close to the pre-desuetudinal stage. But the provincial legislative override is live and well. Nonetheless, scholars 
in Canada and abroad have commonly argued that the legislative override has fallen into desuetude. Some have suggested that there may in fact be a convention against its use. Still others have observed how rarely the override has been used and how reluctant legislatures have been to invoke it. Peter Hogg, for example, uh, has argued that the legislative override, quote, has become relatively unimportant because of the development of a political climate of resistance to its use. Janet Hibbert of Queens has observed that many regard the power as constitutionally illegitimate. Grant Huscroft has described it as unusable. Chris Manfredi and James Kelly have pointed to what they see as its, quote, progressive delegitimization. Goldsworthy, Jeff Goldsworthy, Worthy argues that it's in desuetude. And Howard Leeson argues, I think correctly, that the override is a paper tiger, no more relevant than the Canadian powers of disallowance and reservation. But in fact, neither the federal nor the provincial powers of legislative override has yet fallen into desuetude. Both were introduced, as you know, recently in 1982, which makes it difficult to argue that sufficient time has elapsed to conclude that either power is now obsolete. In fact, many see merit in the concept of the override and believe it should be used more frequently. The Chief Justice of Canada, for example, has herself observed that although the override, quote, has not often been used, perhaps because of the general popularity of the charter, the power, quote, remains available, unquote, to political actors. Moreover, I think it's important to note that the override is more than a ceremonial constraint on the judiciary. Its entrenchment is known to judges who interpret the Constitution cognizant of the possibility of reversal. The court therefore operates under the threat of the override, which gives the override some force. Moreover, and I think this is the important point, few actually realize that the override has been used, and quite often. The provincial override has been used roughly 20 times by four separate legislatures, Alberta, Quebec, Sas Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Uh, its use has also been seriously contemplated on, on at least three other occasions, uh, all three by the provincial government of Alberta. We also know, however, that the federal override has never, in fact, been used. And in light of its 30-year non-use, I think it's fair to say that the federal power of override is therefore at greater risk of falling into desuetude than the provincial power. But for now, given both the frequency of their use and the relative recency, both powers are valid powers, legitimately at, at the disposal of the parliament and the provincial legislatures. Now, who knows what the future will hold? Uh, both powers may eventually follow the powers of disallowance and reservation into desuetude. Um, both uh, powers could lose their legitimacy and over time their non-use may create a convention against their use, approximating a formal amendment entrenching their repeal. Alternatively, only the federal override could fall into desuetude, leaving the provincial power available. It's also perhaps just as possible that the current non-use of the federal override and the roughly 20 uses of the provincial override reflect the Canadian political climate as it is today and not as it is fated to remain. As Peter Hogg, Alison Bushell, and Wade Wright have recently remarked, there's no reason to suppose that the current political reluctance to use Section 33 is a permanent feature of the Canadian legal system, which will prevail no matter what the court does or how public opinion changes or which political parties come into power. So I think we can't quite yet state that a convention prohibits the use of either the federal or the provincial override, nor can we yet project that one or both powers uh, is, is, will fall into desuetude. But I think we can comfortably say that the federal override is closer to falling into desuetude than its provincial analog. So Canada, I think, has, has four desuetudinal powers and two pre-desuetudinal powers. And using these examples, it's possible to create a framework for identifying informal amendments by constitutional desuetude. And the framework I propose has seven criteria. And it borrows from the five criteria I outlined for you a moment ago, posited by Stephen Griffin. So first, a constitutional reordering occurs informally as a result of the sustained non-use of an entrenched provision. Second, that provision is expressly or implicitly repudiated by political actors. Third, a new constitutional rule replaces that repudiated rule 
and thereafter sets the standard for future conduct by political actors. Fourth, the standard is seen as norm generative insofar as it exercises a binding effect that approximates a formal constitutional rule, even though that rule has not been developed uh, formally nor entrenched formally. Fifth, political actors self-consciously follow this new standard, believing themselves bound by it and recognizing that their predecessors intentionally engineered the constitutional ordering. Sixth, this new rule permeates the legal and political classes' conventional understanding of the Constitution. And finally, seventh, despite the affirmation of a new rule that is contrary to the repudiated constitutional rule, the repudiated constitutional rule remains constitutionally entrenched. And I think these seven criteria prove the desuetude of both the British and Canadian powers of reservation and disallowance. Now, we can apply this framework to other countries, and I'd like to do that briefly to the United States. There are a number of possible candidates for constitutional desuetude in the United States. One, maybe, is the natural born citizen clause, which requires candidates to be natural born citizens to run for president. Yet there have been a number of presidential candidates across history who have not actually been born in the United States. George Romney, for example, John McCain in 2008, and perhaps in 2016, Ted Cruz, who was born in nearby Calgary. Second, the Guarantee Clause, which guarantees Republican government in the United States, maybe would be subject to desuetude. I think an argument could be made. The Declaration of War Clause, which authorizes Congress to declare war. Since the American founding, the US has been involved in over 200 armed conflicts, yet Congress has declared war only 11 times the last time being in the Second World War. That's another good candidate for desuetude. I think there are reasons why none of those is actually a, an example of desuetude in the United States, at least not as good an example as either the British or Canadian powers of reservation or disallowance. I think instead, the best expositor of constitutional desuetude in the United States is Article 5 of the US Constitution. This is curious because Article 5 entrenches the rules for formally amending the US Constitution. And this, I think, harkens back to Patricia's opening point, question about whether Part 5 of the Canadian Constitution Act 1982 could itself fall into desuetude. Interesting question. So is it possible that the formula for formal amendment has been informally amended? I think the answer is yes. But Article 5 in the United States is not yet obsolete, but it risks descending into desuetude. Now remember how we're defining desuetude. The sustained and conscious non-use of a rule that's been publicly repudiated by political actors, but that remains entrenched in the constitutional text. This almost fits Article 5. Although there have been thousands of formal amendment proposals since the coming into force of the Constitution in 1789, only 27 have, act have actually ever been ratified. The Constitution's last formal amendment was ratified 20 years ago, in 1992. The next most recent serious Article 5 effort was the Equal Rights Amendment, proposed in 1972, which ultimately failed. Scholars today describe the requirements of Article 5 as virtually impossible to meet. Bruce Ackerman, the, the dean of the, the study of constitutional change in the United States, speaks of Article 5 as establishing, quote, a formidable obstacle course. Sanford Levinson argues that Article 5, practically speaking, brings us all too close to the Lockean dream, or nightmare, of changeless stasis. And Donald Lutz has proven, in fact, that Article 5 makes the Constitution one of the world's most difficult to formally amend. Even Woodrow Wilson, writing in 1885, lamented the, quote, cumbrous machinery of formal amendment erected by Article 5. The difficulty of formally amending the Constitution has, in the United States, pushed most change outside of Article 5 and therefore forced political actors to update the Constitution informally through non-Article 5 methods, for example, through judicial interpretation or through national legislation that has come to be known as super statutes. Article 5 has become so infrequently used in the US that Article 5 amendments have been described by one of the most prominent scholars, David Strauss, as, quote, irrelevant. Nonetheless, I think Article 5 survives when measured against the seven criteria I posited for desuetude. 
The 20 years during which Article 5 has remained unsuccessfully used that has not yet reached the point of sustained non-use. And moreover, although Article 5 continues to be criticized by scholars, it has not yet been repudiated by political actors who continue to call for formal amendments on matters of legal and moral disagreement. In the absence of Article 5's repudiation, we can't say that a new rule has emerged as the standard for political conduct, which in turn means that we cannot identify a new norm, generative, and binding standard. Nor can we discern self-conscious behavior by political actors to follow this new rule. And so without the constitutional reordering that is necessary for desuetude, we can't yet conclude that a new rule has permeated the conventional understanding of Article 5 of the US Constitution. And so for now, uh, we can't yet state that Article 5 has been informally amended. Now before I close, I just want to say a word or two about the costs of constitutional desuetude, the costs. The susceptibility of written constitutions to desuetude, I think, poses important challenges for constitutional law and theory. There are real costs involved when a provision loses its binding force and political actors render it obsolete by their sustained non-use and public repudiation. First, desuetude risks weakening the rule of law by undermining the predictability and stability uh, that a constitutional text provides. It seems to strike at least it seems to, seems to me to strike at the very foundation of written constitutionalism. Second, the phenomenon of constitutional desuetude I think causes difficulties for the judicial function insofar as courts may be put in the position of enforcing a provision that has no public legitimacy. Where a constitutional provision falls into desuetude, there are two options facing a court. First, the court could enforce the constitutional text as written and it could refuse to recognize desuetude as is generally the case actually in common law jurisdiction. Or alternatively, the court could recognize desuetude and declare the desuetudinal provision as invalid. Both cases place the court in a precarious position. In the former, the court would enforce a provision that has been repudiated by political actors and that the constitutional consensus now rejects as binding. In the latter, the court would take the extraordinary action of voiding a provision that remains entrenched in the constitutional text. Neither is optimal, and I think the first may come at the cost of the court's public standing. A third cost of constitutional desuetude concerns constitutional theory. The question whether courts should enforce constitutional desuetude touches upon the expressive function of law. Constitutional provisions may sometimes be intended to express a societal or political aspiration rather than to actually constrain or compel governmental or private action. That constitutional provisions may serve this expressive function should, I think, give pause to judges before they sever a constitutional provision or render it null by interpretation without the legitimacy of participatory and transparent procedures that allow public input. And finally, Constitutional desuetude, I think, complicates our understanding of written constitutions. Constitutions are, I think, properly described as written when they meet four criteria. First, their core principles are codified. Second, um, it forms the basis for all existing and future subsidiary principles. Third, their text is binding. And fourth, the text is specially entrenched against ordinary legislative repeal. Complete codification is, of course, an illusory aspiration insofar as all constitutional regimes rely to some material degree on unwritten conventions. There is an important difference, however, between unwritten conventions and the phenomenon of desuetude. Unwritten conventions are likely to be continuous with the text, whereas provisions informally amended by desuetude are likely to reflect a discontinuity between the text and the written constitution. And for, for jurisdictions where, like the United States, where the Constitution is venerated largely because it is written, this disjunction is problematic. Constitutional desuetude distorts the true content of the written Constitution and does not correct the false impressions that it creates. And so therefore, desuetude, I think, raises serious problems for law and theory. To conclude, 
I think the study of desuetude needs further research, and I'll, I'll continue to do that. I think it'd be useful to explore whether and how desuetude arises beyond Canada. In addition to monitoring the quasi-desuetudinal status of Article 5, I think future studies might continue to probe the U.S. Constitution for occurrences of existing or anticipated desuetude. I think it would also be profitable to investigate desuetude in other long-standing liberal democratic constitutions, namely the 1814 Norwegian Constitution, the 1900 Australian Constitution, the 1920 Austrian Constitution, and perhaps also the 1950 Indian Constitution. And I think that the study of comparative constitutional change will only grow stronger with further research into maybe four or five uh, items. One is this phenomenon of desuetude. Two, how and why it happens and manifests itself. Three, what its costs and effects are to constitutionalism. Whether and how its occurrence can be anticipated and more interestingly, subsequently reversed. And five, who among political actors is best situated to identify and respond to desuetude? From my perspective, the study of desuetude is equally important for a more fundamental reason, which aligns with my interest in the study of constitutions comparatively. And that is that it returns our focus to the text of the Constitution. Informal amendment, which is now all the rage in the United States, in Germany, in India, across the world, even here in Canada, informal amendment has shifted our attention from the text toward the judiciary and to other political actors whose interpretations and actions effectively entrench unwritten constitutional amendments. But constitutional desuetude begins from the proposition, important one I think, that the text matters. But it recognizes that constitutional meaning today commonly evolves extra textually, which I think is important. So thank you very much for your time and your interest. I look forward to any questions and comments.